we gather together in the grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us stand as we hear our call to worship, this call from Psalm 33 that calls us to unite together as God's people and shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we come this morning to sing your praise, to lay at your feet our deepest needs and fears, and to hear the truth of your word, but most importantly, to meet you face to face in Jesus Christ. And so we pray this morning that indeed you would meet us here, that you would shower your spirit upon us, that our worship would be in spirit and in truth, and that you, our God, would be praised and glorified, for you alone are worthy, worthy, worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please take your hymnals and let us sing number 296, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
great it is to consider that time is coming where for all eternity we will praise the name of our faithful <laughs> Savior as we stand in his presence with him. But this morning we come remembering that we are yet a sinful people in need of God's abundant grace to us in Christ. So I invite you to confess your sins with me, remembering that the promise is true that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Let us pray together. Lord, though you should guide us, we inform ourselves. Though you should rule us, we control ourselves. Though you should fulfill us, we console ourselves. We think your truth too high, your will too hard, your power too remote, your grace too free. But they are not. And without them, we are of all people most miserable. O oh Lord, heal our confused minds with your word. Heal our divided wills with your law. Heal our troubled consciences with your love. Heal our anxious hearts with your presence. All for the sake of your Son who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen. And we rejoice as God's people in God's faithfulness to us in Christ. We remember that gospel from 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 9 through 11. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. And it is that Lord Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and coming again, that we confess publicly with our mouths, putting all pretenders to the throne aside and declaring Jesus Christ as King and God as our God. The words of the Nicene Creed this morning are printed on the back of your bulletin insert. Christian, what do you believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one brother, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, Light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As we... Confess those words together of the glorious work of Christ for us, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the coming eternity we have with our God. Let us stand and sing number 463, A Debtor to Mercy Alone.
And indeed, a salvation that is so secure because it is accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord, that as we've just sung, we can never be more secure than we are in this moment 
And so, Lord God, grant us assurance of your work, of your grace, of your mercy, and of your peace in us. And we pray, O oh Lord, that indeed as that certainty is sure and as you stir up assurance in our hearts, as you strengthen the weakness of our faith as we live from day to day, moment to moment, that you would keep our hearts and our minds, indeed the steps that we walk and the words that we speak and that which we hear all conform to your image and to your word. Guard us and guide us through this life that we as your people would see that joy of our salvation. Now no more secure, but indeed growing in delight and in joy as we remember your peace to us in Christ. We come this morning giving you thanks for this church, this opportunity to be an expression of your body here in Farmington, Maine. And we pray earnestly for Franklin County and indeed all the surrounding towns and communities. We pray, Lord, that as this town begins to swell and grow as um, students return to the university that you would give us opportunities to show those students and the faculty and the staff that true wisdom is in Jesus Christ and that there is only hope and peace and not making ourselves after the image of who we are in our mind but there is hope and peace in being transformed and conformed to the image of Christ Jesus. We pray, O oh Lord, for our neighbors and our co-workers, those people who we see so regularly, those people whom we often have conflicts with, those people that you have called us to love even when they're friends or enemies. We pray for your mercy upon them. We pray that you would give us boldness to invite them to come and, and experience this day of rest in Christ. That they would come and that they would hear the gospel spoken from our mouths. And that they would know the love of God in Christ Jesus for them as your spirit opens their heart and their minds to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We pray for our families and our loved ones. We pray for those who have rejected the call of Christ or have yet to embrace it. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would faithfully call them to you. Give them living hearts of flesh where once they only knew death. We pray for the children of our congregation we pray, O oh Lord, that you would have mercy upon them, that even as they've gone through life, never remembering a day that they did not hear the name of Jesus Christ spoken, may they call upon his name. May they know that truth for their own deep in their heart. May they live out from that truth in their mind and in their will. May they worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray for those not with us, for the Bustamantes as they're homesick. We pray for your mercy upon them. Return them to us with great joy as we gather again as your people. We pray that you would continue to see this work here prosper, not in the terms of man, but in the terms of your word. Indeed, as we grow deeper in its knowledge and its love for you. Indeed, as you make us more like Christ. And as you bring to unite with us those who are your sons and daughters. We pray, O oh Lord, for the churches of our presbytery. We thank you for the work of the presbytery and the work of um, that it does in 
and <coughs> planting churches and supporting um, home missions and, and foreign missions and, and work that it does and, and working out the difficult things that come before it. Give wisdom and grace to those men that you have raised up, that we would be called shepherds and that we would love your people well. We pray for the churches of this nation. We pray that faithfulness would be on their lips and from their pulpits. We pray for revival that you bring as your spirit goes forth in power. We pray for our government, for our leaders, our governor of this state, for our president and vice president. Have mercy upon them. For those who make laws, for those who judge laws, we pray, O oh Lord, that they would know that justice is in Jesus Christ and that their only hope in life and death is that they are not their own. It is not their power. It is not their wisdom, but it is Jesus Christ and him only. We pray for the church around the world. Even as I heard this morning, as yet another church in China being raided by the, by the government and by the police, as the pastors are arrested, and, and the agony of it that a, a woman in this church even had a heart attack in that moment, we pray for your mercy upon them. Strengthen them, encourage them. May they know that you are always with them, never leave them or forsake them. And, O oh Lord, we pray for the persecutors, that though they hide in the shadow of darkness, may they come to see the glorious life-giving light of Jesus Christ. And may they, like Paul, be able to cry out that Christ Jesus came to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. O oh Lord, we pray for all these things in the name of our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Let us stand as God's people to sing Psalm 145. We find these words on page 5 in our hymnal. God my King, thy might confessing. Let us stand to sing. <laughs>
We come now to God's word to proclaim to proclaim his sovereign power and his eternal word. This morning in the New Testament from Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 through 12. As we hear of the great multitude from every nation. Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 through 12. This is the word of the Lord. After this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, Standing before the throne of the Lamb, clothed in the white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and forever. Amen. Indeed, as we have sung this morning, let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball, to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. And then if you would turn to Genesis Chapter 3, we've spent many, many weeks, more than 15, I believe, in Genesis 1 through 3. My original plan was to wrap up Genesis 3 this morning, but as you can see, I broke those last four or five verses into two sections. So this morning, we will consider just verses 20 to 21. Genesis chapter 3, verses 20 to 21. Again, the word of the Lord. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Let us give thanks for God's word. Almighty and ever living God. Your word is true and abiding. And so give us ears to hear. Give us hearts to believe. That we would respond with the faith that you have given us by your spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It is a life and death matter. It's a matter of life and death. No doubt we have all spoken those words out of the fear and concern of our hearts to see the urgency of a situation. Perhaps we've even spoken those words to call ourselves or call one another back from the precipice. It's not a matter of life and death. This morning in Genesis 3 verses 20 and 21, we continue to hear of the life and death matter of sin isn't it true that for a world broken and cursed by sin, that everything is a life and death matter? And it's often easy as we are bombard bombarded with this world, as we live in this world, as we contribute to this world of sin, it's easy to forget, to neglect the life and death seriousness of the situation that we find ourselves in. Adam and Eve, as we have explored in detail, stood at the crossroads of life and death. 
as they stood there in the garden with the tree of life before them, life there for the taking should they obey and reject the forbidden fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And on the other hand, that curse of death, that promise that invaded the garden, that death of the poison of Satan's words in rejecting God's truth, that death that came in eating the forbidden fruit. We realize that on that one day in the garden, Adam and Eve awoke to the promise of life, to live as God's people in his presence forever and forever. But as the sun fell on that day, as they closed their eyes in sleep, they closed their eyes <coughs> into the death of their wilderness <coughs> exile. A lot can change in the course of a day <coughs> as they live with a matter of life and death. And it wasn't only their choice to disobey that had this ultimate seriousness, but it was also the resulting consequences. Quite literally, this matter of life and death, as that life which they awoke to by promise, they went to sleep in, realizing that death was now the law of the world that God had created. And death seems like a final sentence. And indeed, there is a finality to it, isn't there? For God's word is certain. His word is sure. And his word is true. It may be certain, but it is not the last word of God's story. For in the midst of his just death sentence on sin, God promises the gracious gift of life. It's not a promise that uh, seeks to undermine, to, to compromise, or to ignore that justice of God. It's not a promise that seeks to scoot around what God has declared, but it's a promise of grace that sees the judgment of the law and the sentence of death Paid in full. And out of that death. To bring life. Not a life that perpetuates the corrupted life of sin that we experience now. Nor a life that is a return to that corruptible life that Adam and Eve knew in the garden. Where they had that ability to to sin, to choose to disobey God, but to bring a life of glorious blessedness, a life of resurrection life in Jesus Christ. And it's here that we find that the center of all history comes to its focal point in the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ faces death so that you would know resurrection life. Everything before looks forward. Everything after reflects back. I was listening to a sermon on another passage entirely by Sinclair Ferguson, and he talked about how we all are familiar with the concept of the sequel, that which comes after that which um, explains what happens next. We know the sequel to the cross is the return of Christ. And with him comes the death of death. For there's neither sorrow nor tears. But there's life with Christ for his people forever and ever. But like the sequel, there's another word that we use. It's very common today, but I discovered from Sinclair Ferguson that it's a relatively new word only for the past 50 years or so. And that is the prequel. The prequel is that which comes before. That which describes what came later. 
and all of history leading up to Jesus Christ is the prequel. It explains the purpose of Christ's coming as man and dying on the cross. It tells us of sin and of God's justice. It tells us of death and God's gracious gift of life. It tells us of the promise and of God's faithfulness. This prequel is filled with pictures. It's filled with reoccurring patterns and themes and images that remind us of that life and death matter before us. And it reminds us of God's promise to bring life out of death. In these two verses that we've read this morning from Genesis chapter 3, there are actually three pictures there. Three of these pictures that fill and pervade the prequel of God's story. Whose threads are rich colors in the tapestry of God's promises that filled in Christ Jesus. These pictures are the name and the sacrifice of and the coverings. And as we consider these three pictures, I want us to trace a little bit these threads, and I want us to see how the name, the sacrifice, and the covering point us forward to Jesus Christ, so that we, who we are now, look back on Christ and see our eternity in Him. First, this morning, we consider that the name of life confirms God's promises to us. Names are important things, aren't they? Because they tell us something about what they are named. Oftentimes when a parent names a child, they do it because that name has a meaning or has a significance, whether it was the definition of the word itself or whether it was someone who came before who exhibited a quality that you wanted to see in your child. Names are important. Adam here in verse 21 or sorry, in verse 20, names his wife. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. As Adam comes and names his wife, he accomplishes two things. On the one hand, he fulfills God's calling that was placed on him back um, in chapter 2, that calling to bring, name the animals as God brought them to him, and he says, name the animals and find for yourself a suitable companion. And he went by animal and by animal and by animal, and he named them all, but there was not found for him a companion suited for him. And it was here that God made his helper. It was here that God made the woman from his side, forming the woman to complement and to complete him. And together they were to live out this calling to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth and to subdue it. But even now, in the face of the shadow of death, God completes this work. He completes this work, this calling, as he gives the name of life to the woman. He names her Eve. The second thing that Adam accomplishes is that he reinforces that promise that God made to them amidst the threat or the consequences of the curse. This name that God gives his wife is a name that will be a perpetual reminder both to her and to herself and to their offspring, even down generation from generation to us today as God's promise stands. This name, Eve, is given because she was the mother of all living. This name is a name of vital importance. In fact, in Hebrew, that name, Eve, is a feminized version of the word for life. And doesn't this strike you as odd? 
It strikes me as odd that those who are content to die because of their sin are given the name of life. Eve is named because she's the mother, not of the dead, but of all the living. How is it that she's the mother of the living? It is that through her life, it is that through her children, it is that through the generations of generations of generations that follow, there will come the seed of the woman who will crush that serpent's head. There will come the seed of the woman who will bring life out of death as his own heel is bruised. And so Eve here stands as a promise to us today that by her name, you are alive and you are alive in Jesus Christ. And that's that's promise that God made to Eve and to Adam in the garden. This promise of life finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Even as Eve was named the mother of all the living, everywhere they went, death followed. It's only a few short verses before we hear of that tragic story of Cain and Abel. Death and judgment once again. And even as their descendants spiral down into death and sin, as we hear of the tragedy of life, God's promise of life out of death reigns true. And in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ would come and in his own death bring life. In his own death upon the cross, as one who knew no sin, taking the sins of the world upon him, would die death. Submitting willingly to that curse of sin, but in power rising again in glory and in resurrection life. Eve would and did bear children. Yes, in pain, but bringing new life in the midst of death. Eve, or Adam, would toil and sweat. He would labor in pain. But he and his children and his wife would eat of the work of his hands, sustaining his life. Eve was the mother of all living you know, you as God's people, as the sons and daughters of the living God, are given the gift of Christ's name to you. And in that name comes the promise of life eternal. One of the most profound doctrines that I find in Scripture is that doctrine of union with Christ. That we who are lost and dead in our sins by the power of the Spirit, are made alive, and not just alive to wander around like a chicken with its head cut off in all of its chaos, but with purpose and dignity and glory as we are united to Jesus Christ with an inseparable bond as he takes us in all of our twisted, distorted sinfulness and he molds us and creates us as his new creation and in his image. And it's within that union that you are named sons and daughters. You're given that family relationship. You are named by the name of God in Christ Jesus. And I know I've said it before, but I'll say it again. It is why you are Christian. Because you are named by Christ. What does that mean? That means that in Christ's death, you died. Even as Christ died to sin and to death, you died with him. I am crucified with Christ. You are dead to sin. And out of death, life. 
you are crucified with Christ. Therefore, it's you who no longer live, but it is Christ who lives in you. In union with Christ, you live in Christ, in resurrection life, as he calls you his own, as you call him, as he calls you to the light in his word, as he makes you his child and an heir to all the promises of God in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> All those named with the name of Christ are sealed with that promise of life. And that union stands as a perpetual reminder, even as it is a reality, it's a reminder that the promises of God made from the beginning of time until today and for all eternity are yours. Out of death, life, spiritual life, physical life, eternal life, life in <coughs> Jesus Christ. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. For life to come out of death, there must be it's the second point, right? The death of God's creature foreshadows Christ's sacrifice for us. For life to come out of death, there must be death, because this was God's judgment against sin. And God's kindness, God's mercy, God's grace, God's promise of life does not compromise his word. God's grace does not compromise God's justice. For if it did, we would not have a God that we could trust. We would not have a God worth the worship and the sacrifice of life. But God's grace and mercy and peace and life comes because death was promised and death comes. In verse 21 of Genesis chapter 3, we read this. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins. As Adam and Eve stood side by side before the presence of God, Naked, exposed, and ashamed as he brought the judgment of curse and death upon them, there was nothing that they could do. They couldn't sew fig leaves together. They tried, but it wouldn't cover their shame. They couldn't run and hide. They tried. And God saw them and he knew. But they faced head on God's death sentence. But within that sentence comes that promise of life. And with the promise of life, within the curse of sin comes a tragedy of death. God doesn't tell us how he did it. But we know that God took one of his precious creatures that he had formed from the dust of the ground, even as he had formed Adam and Eve from the dust of the ground. And he took this creature that he had given life to, and he sacrificed it. He brought death into his world as a substitute so that his People created in his image would live another day, that his promise that life would come out of death would be seen even in this moment. This animal death served as a substitute. The immediate death of a creature so that God's image bearers might live. This is, not, this is the first, but it is not the last and the final time we see this in God's word. We could fast forward the pages to the story of Abraham and Isaac. As Isaac is lying there on the altar, as God had called Abraham to sacrifice his one and only son, 
that child of God's promise, that through Isaac all the promises of God rested, for God had invested it into him. What would God do? How would God work? God brought a substitute, one who would stand in, in the thicket to preserve the life of this child, a lamb who was sacrificed instead of Isaac. We could fast forward yet again, and we could consider Moses and the Israelites and the Passover as they are there in Egypt with that threat of the death of every firstborn. But only those who sacrifice the lamb in their place. Only those who have the blood of the lamb on their doorpost. Only those who have eaten of that sacrificial meal would see life. Out of death because the lamb stood in its place. And we could fast forward yet again to see Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who became man like us. To live in this world of sin without sin. To know the suffering and the discouragement and the fear of this world. To suffer and to learn obedience unto death, even death on the cross. Not for himself, but for you. Christ stood in your place. Those words ring true. In my place. Condemned he stood. Christ knew no sin. He was the lamb without blemish. And he bears the scars of your sins. Even as the disciples afterwards saw the nail-pierced hands. He took your sin and knew the searing pain of humiliation, of judgment, and of death. And out of his death comes life. It comes life for Christ, the risen and exalted Son of God in power forever and ever. And you who are united to him by faith as you are sealed to him by the Spirit, life for you. Christ, the first fruits of the resurrection. You, the harvest of life for all eternity. The death of God's creature foreshadows the sacrifice for us. But finally, this morning, that third picture of the covering of skins that points us to Christ's righteousness that covers over us. With that promise of life and with that death of your Savior, Jesus Christ, what is accomplished is your justification by faith. And that justifi justification by faith is that covering of Christ's righteousness over you. Verse 21 concludes as he says, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. God took this animal. He sacrificed and brought death. And from the skin of this animal, he fashioned and he formed a covering for Adam and Eve. He did it because that the fig leaves that they had sown for them wouldn't cover their sin and shame. But the death, the death of a creature brought a temporary covering. A covering that would need to be sacrificed again and again and again. And we see God at work in his divine act as working out this promise of life. In this picture that says, I will cover my people and I will hide their shame. I will protect my people as I will cover them and protect them from their vulnerability. I will care for my people as I cleanse them and make them my own. My beloved whom I have redeemed from their death by the death of my own son. This covering was not merely to give them warmth as they went out into 
the wilderness was a covering as a sign of God's promise to them, sealing them to the promise of God who promised to follow them through the wilderness and to bring them back into paradise in Jesus Christ. Doesn't it strike you as Christ faced the cross, as Christ is tortured and mocked, that it's very pointed that one of the things that the people do to him is strip him of his robes. They strip him of his garments. They leave him there naked and exposed. And they take these prized garments and divide it among themselves as if somehow they have gained an advantage over this one condemned to die. And it's here, exposed and humiliated, that he took upon himself your sin. He took upon himself your shame and he took upon himself your guilt and he faces the judgment of God's wrath in your place. Enduring the shame of the cross that in his obedience unto death, even death on the cross, he would hear those words of justification from his father. You are my beloved son. In you, I am well pleased. You know, you, dear friends, you who are named with the name of Jesus Christ, you who are the sons and the daughters of the living Christ, have been given robes as well. You have been given robes of righteousness, robes that are stained by the blood of Christ and robes that are whiter than snow. Isaiah says in chapter 61, verse 10, prophesying from the name of the Lord, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. And so, paraphrasing John Owen, we drag our sin. As we drag ourselves to the foot of the cross and we expose ourselves naked and ashamed to the cross of Christ. And that death sentence that is upon us, the judge says, Christ has died for you. Here, arise, stand. I will hold you. I will strengthen you. And I will cover you with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And indeed, you stand before the glory of God. And he looks down and, at, and, and he sees you not in your sinfulness, but in the righteousness of Christ. So he can look upon you as he said to Christ that you are his beloved son. You are his beloved daughter. And he is well pleased with you because he is well pleased with your Savior. Jesus Christ. Isn't that picture striking in Revelation 7 that we read this morning as John looked and beheld a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages standing before the throne of the Lamb, the Lamb who was slain the Lamb who lives. And what are these people from every nation and from every tribe and from every language wearing? They are clothed in white robes, for they are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And they cry out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. 
brothers and sisters. Jesus and his blood and his righteousness are your beauty and your glorious dress that in this midst of flaming worlds you stand arrayed as bride fit for her groom so that with joy you can lift up your head and sing with the saints for all eternity past, for all eternity forever and ever. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, the Lamb who was slain, the Lamb who lives. These three things, the name, the sacrifice, and the covering, pictures given to Adam and Eve that pointed to our reality. And that reality is given to you in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the pictures of your word. Pictures that bring before our eyes the very truth and the very reality of your salvation for us in Jesus Christ. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would revive us by your Spirit, and that we as your people would put to death sin and live unto righteousness for your sake and for your glory. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let us respond to God's word with this hymn on page 520. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my glory are, my glorious dress. Let us stand to sing 520. <coughs>
privilege now as God's people to present our tithes and our offerings as an act of worship before God. Father, we do thank you for the privilege of being your people. We thank you for that free gift in Jesus Christ that covers our sin and our shame. And so we bring this offering to you as an act of worship, and we pray that you would use it for your glory. And we pray that we would remember that all of our life is yours. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let us stand and respond with the singing of the doxology. Let us stand together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, above the heavenly host. Praise Father. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Go in peace.